a tar part two tonight from last week. Can God fulfill his purposes for your life? And we're going to read three verses at the end of Isaiah 35, 8, 9, and 10. It says, A highway will be there, a roadway, and it will be called the highway of holiness. And the unclean will not travel on it, but it will be for him that walks that way. Fools will not wander on it. Um, quick question, is there a definite path for the redeemed to walk on on their way to heaven? Yes. 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 And then verse 9 says, No lion will be there, nor will any vicious beast go up on it. These will not be found there, but the redeemed will walk there. And the ransomed of the Lord will return and come with joyful shouting to Zion, with everlasting joy upon their heads. They will find gladness and joy and sorrow and sighing will flee away. When it says they will come with joyful shouting to Zion, what is Zion another name for? Heaven. In Hebrews chapter 12, um, it talks about you have come to Mount Zion to the city of the living God. It's another name for heaven. It's talking about heaven here. What characterizes, if you look at this verse, what characterizes their walk to heaven? Joy, joy, gladness and joy. I would say joy wins, right? Okay. Are the redeemed totally stressed out about fulfilling the plan of God for their lives on the way to heaven, according to God? No. No. Now, the reason I want to talk about this is I know a whole lot of people that are happy about most things in their lives, but they're not happy about the fact they don't think that what God really created them for is happening. Okay, look, I want to convince you tonight, or hope, try it. Do you realize that if you, if I brought, this is a personal thing, but if I brought you up here and said, if you could see exactly what God created you to do happening in your life, how would you feel? I'll tell you how you'd feel. You'd be jumping out of your skin happy. Okay? Hallelujah. But the truth of the matter is, a whole lot of people, a whole lot of the time, feel like life is so daily. It's so daily. You know, you just do what you got to do, and you're not making progress. And I want to try to convince you from the book of Ezra that if you can believe Ezra, Ezra is too good to be true. Ezra is the kind of book you read it and you think, this is the stuff of fairy tales. This is the stuff of pagan kings commanding them. Teach the word, and if anybody won't listen to the word, let them be put to death. A pagan king. I'm going to show it to you. It's in the scripture. Now, if, a, if God can take people who've been in exile and have no hope of ever fulfilling the plan of God for their lives and do everything they need for their lives, I want to know why are we so slow to believe that what God has promised in our lives Okay, let me ask you this. Yeah. These folks that are on their way to Zion, it says, they're, read it with me, and the ransomed of the Lord will return and come with joyful shouting to Zion, with everlasting joy on their heads. They will find gladness and joy and sorrow and sign will flee away. And let me ask you this. If they rejoice, will they see more of the will of God fulfilled in their lives than if they don't rejoice? Yes. Then why are we not rejoicing more? Now, I'm, not, I'm talking to me. I said we, not you. God wants us to look into the future with the eye of faith. I, I'll use Bill for an example. He never gets mad at me. Bill, he wants you to look ahead and see everything you ever dreamed for his dream. And then start dancing on it before we see. God wants you to believe. Every one of us here, and I know it's personal. I would love to come up and interview every single person here. If you could see your dreams fulfilled, what would you be doing? And you say, but that can't happen. If you can believe Ezra, you can believe that God is good enough and able enough to fulfill your destiny. Uh, let's go over, boy, this is really hard. I want to ask you one more time. This group of folks we have on the exact highway to heaven, are they all stressed out about whether God's going to fulfill God? There? No. You know why? Because it's not your place to fulfill it. It's as faithful as he called you who will also do it. Yeah. All right. Hallelujah. If I get over words, it's because you're not. Psalm 138, verse 8. I want to show you three places in the scripture right now where it says if you are willing to cooperate with the plan of God, it is going to happen. Yeah. Do you understand that we're living in a dream here? Yes. Yeah, come on. 
Come on, you say, well, dreams just don't come true. Might have it all come true, but some of my dreams, I have one dream sitting right there. She was a dream for seven years. I prayed for this child. She's a total and complete miracle to where when we, I know you know the story, but when we had her taken back to NIH, they said, have her DNA checked. She can't be yours, Mr. Mark. There is no way she's yours. I thought that was, he thought I was mad. No, I'm not mad. It's the funniest thing I ever heard. I know she's a miracle. This room that we're sitting in is a dream come true. We dreamed and dreamed and dreamed. That's the people who've been here. And then the devil comes up and says, nothing's happening. Ever heard that guttural voice? Nothing's happening. Yeah. We're going to squelch that lie tonight if you want to. Read this with me. The Lord will accomplish what concerns me. Your loving kindness, O Lord, is everlasting. Do not forsake the works of your hands. We're going to read in three more translations, if you could put them up here. King, New King James, read it with me. The Lord will perfect that which concerns me. Your mercy, O Lord, endures forever. Do not forsake the work of your hands. Is doing the will of God something that concerns you? Big time. I mean, is there anybody here that if Jesus Christ walked in right now, shook your hand, said, I just want you to know that everything I ever created you to do, you're going to do it. And when I, you stand before me, I'm going to say, very well done, good and faithful servant. Hallelujah. Could you put a, would that put a dance in your step? Yes. Yeah. Well, the time to get happy is now. He just said, the Lord, read this one with me, New, New Living. The Lord will work out his plans for my life, for your faith, love, O oh Lord, endures forever. Don't abandon me, for you made me. Next is the message, I believe. Read it with me. Finish what you started in me, O oh God. Your love is eternal. Don't quit on me now. You see, we think that maybe we kind of got ourselves this far. How many of you think you've brought yourself this far? That you've changed yourself as much as you have changed? How many of you know that God Almighty has changed the way you love, the way you think, the way you get up in the morning? All right? He brought you this far, and he said, the Lord will perfect what concerns me. That's scripture number one. Number two, I'm going to give you two or three witnesses. The Bible says in the mouth of two or three witnesses, you establish a fact. If you can find it two or three places in the Bible, don't even worry about whether it's true. And you say, but I'm not seeing it happen. Yeah, I know that voice says, it's not happening. I've heard that voice. <laughs> it's not happening. I heard that voice when I was 20, 25, 30, 35. All right? But it's happening, people. And if you don't stay happy and in, and in sync with the Holy Spirit, you could miss it. That's not. Now look at the next scripture. Philippians 1, 6. This is, this is Bible. You might not like me, but this is Bible. Listen. For I am confident. Read it with me. For I am confident of this very thing. That he who began a good work in you will perfect it until the day of Christ Jesus. How many of you need perfecting? How many of you need help getting on track? He just told you he's going to do it. Yeah. Every time got something unexpected comes up and it looks like it could be good, say, Oh, thank God, the good hand of the Lord is upon me. That's what yes. Ezra said over and over and over and over. You've got to... Okay. Amen. Has anybody besides me noticed that it's easier to see the good hand of God in somebody else's life than in your own life? Absolutely. Miss Margie used to come up and say, now can't you see how much better it was? And she would point out like a dozen things that I didn't even, re and timing and stuff. Are you following? Yeah. No. It's time for us to recognize the good hand of the Lord in our lives. So he says, I'm confident. You can read that in any translation that says the same thing. First Thessalonians 5.24. I'm going to read it two translations. Read it with me. Faithful is he who calls you, and he also will bring it to pass. Now, does he say faithful is he who calls you, and he'll help you bring it to pass? No. no. That's kind of humbling, isn't it? Yeah. Kind of humbling. Do you know what he needs? He needs your cooperation and your affection. You say, why does he need my affection? Because the greatest commandment is not, you shall obey the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. Oh, come on. The greatest commandment is you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind. Love produces obedience, but obedience in itself is not enough. That's right. You weren't just created to be a robot and, and obey him because he's God. You were, you were created to adore him. Yeah. Okay, let's read it in the um, Amplified. Faithful is he who is calling you to himself and utterly trustworthy, and he will also do it. Fulfill his call by hallowing and keeping you. Just to be clear, 
The Lord will not fulfill his will in your life in spite of you. you. We realize this. If you're out making wrong decisions, if you're not living holy, you can forget about doing his life. But if he has your cooperation, you will fulfill his purpose in life if you stay happy. Yeah. And you say, why do you have to stay happy? Because faith is happy. Yeah. Faith does not have to see to believe. Faith believes. To fulfill his purpose, as I just said, the Lord needs your willingness, your affection, and cooperation. If you're willing and obedient, then the Lord has obligated. Please listen to this. This is so important. I've got proof right here in the Word tonight. And if you believe it, you're going to be a happier person. And you say, and some of you will think, oh, she's picking on me because she knows I'm distressed because I'm not seeing God's plan. I'm picking on at least two dozen people. So don't <laughs> There's a whole bunch of people that they're not happy because it's not happening. That voice is, it's not happening. It's happening. Yeah. If you are willing and obedient, the Lord has obligated himself to supply all the details of his plan that you need each day. You don't have all the details of the plan, but you'll have, tomorrow you'll have all the details you need for tomorrow what to right. do. And how to do it. He will supply all the open doors, all the strength, health, and longevity, all the protection, spirit, soul, and body, all the protection you need, all the finances you need, all the people you need to help, and all the open doors. And you said you said that twice. That's right, because people get really upset about not having the open doors. How many of you have ever seen a door pop open? And you know good and well that door was God, right? Yeah. Doors pop open, presence of God. Okay, go to go to Jeremiah 29. I better hurry. Oh my goodness. It's going to be a six-month message and they don't hurry up. <laughs> and you say, that's not good. I've never, you know, I know preachers that have preached on Ephesians 1 for like a year and a half. <laughs> never managed to do that, but. Uh -huh. Jeremiah 29, 10 and 11. We're talking about Ezra here. The Lord prophesied before they ever went through Jeremiah, for thus says the Lord, when 70 years have been completed for Babylon, I will visit you and fulfill my good word to you to bring you back to this place. Next verse, for, read it with me. For I know the plans that I have for you, declares the Lord. Plans for welfare and not for calamity, to give you a future and not a hope. So this verse that we love so much and put on our mugs and refrigerator was written in the context of a promise given before it ever happened, that after you're taken into captivity, you'll spend 70 years there, but I will bring you back. Yeah. So let me ask you some questions real fast. How long would they have to stay in Babylon? 70, 70 years. years. Is it the will of God that they return? Yes. Do they have to fulfill the word? No. 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 How could they fulfill the word? They're captives. Right. A lot of them are broke. There's no way to do a four-month journey. We're going to see that under best-case scenario, Ezra made it four months and rejoiced. That's a long journey, walking yeah. for four months. Say this with me. When God makes a promise, God makes a promise. only he can fulfill it. Only. What we have to do is cooperate. Only. Stay, eligible for, the Stay eligible for the fulfillment. Do you realize that if you could do it, you wouldn't need a promise? That's right. If you could draw the plan for your life, you wouldn't need a God. Right. God has different and better plans for you than you have. Yep. Yeah. So when the 70 years in captivity are up, they're still captives with few resources, but it is the plan of God for the temple to be rebuilt. Can they just pick up, leave Susa, the capital city, and, and fund the journey? No, they can't leave. They can't fund. They, and you're saying, they're a bunch of kids. So are you. <laughs> Which part of the call are you going to be able to fulfill on your own? Right. You know, that's why the Holy Spirit came. Yeah. The Holy Spirit came so you'd have the right ideas, the right love, the right wisdom, the right insight, the right motives behind your motives. You don't have to do anything but cooperate. Right. And I'm telling you, when you're 30 years older than you are right now, you'll know that better than you know tonight. Amen. The longer they live, the more you understand you can do nothing. And you say, is that righteous that I can do nothing of myself? The Lord Jesus Christ said it. John chapter 5. He said, I can do nothing of myself unless it's something I see the Father do it. Now, if he could do nothing of himself, how much of the plan do you think you'll fulfill by yourself? Right. Okay, go to, I knew you'd like that. And <laughs> everybody say, this is humbling. Because I have to look to God. Ezra 1. This is truth. This is absolute truth. And I'm absolutely convinced that I could. You see, you're not here on a Wednesday night. A few of you might be here to 
see friends, but most of you are here because you are avid pursuers of the will of God. You really, really, really want to do the will of God. How many of you say, I really, 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 yeah, that's why we're here. And if you aren't that way when you come, you either get that way or you leave. You, we drive you nuts. <laughs> All right? Everybody here has a passion to please Jesus. All right, now let's read Ezra really fast. Ezra 1 and 2, now in the first year of Cyrus, king of Persia, in order to fulfill the word of the Lord. By the mouth of Jeremiah, the Lord stirred up the spirit of Cyrus, king of Persia, so that he sent a proclamation throughout all his kingdom and also put it in writing, saying, Thus says Cyrus, king of Persia, the Lord, the God of heaven, has given me all the kingdoms of the earth, and he has appointed me to build him a house in Jerusalem, which is in Judah. Who was appointed to build the house? Cyrus, a pagan king. I don't know if we have time to go there, but if you'll read in Isaiah 44 and Isaiah 45, the Lord speaks of Cyrus before he was born. He tells what he's going to do. Do you want to read it? Isaiah 44, 28. You've got to realize, if you can believe what we're reading tonight, and you've got any sense at all that God does not change. It says in Malachi, I, the Lord, do not change. He said in Hebrews 13, Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today, and forever. How many believe that? Amen. But he was to them, he is to us. If you can believe he did all this, you must certainly be able to believe he can fulfill his plan for your life. Amen. <laughs> Look at, this is Isaiah 44, 28. Isaiah prophesied about 700 years before Cyrus, no, a few hundred years, a few hundred years before Cyrus was born. It is I who says of Cyrus, he is my shepherd, and he will perform all my desire. And he declares of Jerusalem, she will be built, and of the temple your foundation will be laid. He prophesied of the man uh, over a hundred years. I forget, it was between one and two hundred years before the man was conceived in his mother's womb. The Lord said, this is what Cyrus will do. Right. I mean, he can't talk to your boss. Uh -huh. God can talk to unsaved people. Right. Yeah. Look at Isaiah 45, 1 and 4, and then we'll get back to Ezra. Thus says the Lord to Cyrus is anointed, whom I have taken by the right hand. When was he going to take him by the right hand? In a couple hundred years. To subdue nations before him and to loose the loins of kings. To open doors before him so that gates will not be shut. And then skip down to verse 4. For the sake of Jacob, my servant, Israel, my chosen one, I have called you by your name. I have given you a title of honor, though you have not known me. Now, if I can believe... I mean, this sounds like a fairy tale. I never told my kids fairy tales. I only wanted them to hear stuff they could believe. Yeah. But I want to tell you something. This sounds too good to be true. God speaking to a pagan king to let his people go over, over 100 years before he was conceived. How many of you believe that actually happened way back then, 700-something B.C.? How many of you believe that in 2017 A.D., God could still talk to people? And, okay. All right, so the Lord is using a non-Jewish king to declare, promote, and finance his purposes. As I said last week, suppose you're a little Jewish shoemaker in Susa, or a seamstress in Susa. You're born there, you're like 30 years old, they've been there 70 years. You're just sewing your shoes or whatever you do, sewing your dresses. And one day the Lord speaks to you and he says, my temple needs rebuilt. And somehow... Whatever it is you've got in your heart, God put it there in a way you can't exactly explain it. You couldn't get it out of you. Somebody couldn't beat it out of you, what you're called to do. Right. All right? Yeah. How do you know? I don't know. How do you know? You tell me. So the seamstress, so the shoemaker, all of a sudden he knows, I'm supposed to see that God's temple is rebuilt. What in the world is he going to do about it? He's not free to leave. He was taken there, a four-month journey captive, all right. Yeah. Yeah. If that's you, could you just pick up and go? Would it be safe? Are you kidding me? Do you have the money? Does your answering no mean, okay, it's not going to happen? All right. Let's, let's back up. Do you, if you don't have faith for you, how many of you know there's something you do and you'd sketch out and do it if you could do it? You, God's put it in your heart. I'll write you with something. All right. Do you have faith? That somebody in the capital of Susa in Babylon, at about how many, 400 and something, no, about five, 510 BC, after they've been there about 70 years, could have their heart stirred up to say, You're one of the ones I need to help build a temple. Could that happen? Uh -huh. Could God speak to a pagan king to let you go and to fund the journey and to keep you? Yeah. Hallelujah. Yeah. All right, we're going to read it fast. 
verse 5. Okay, let's read verse 3. We're not going to get anywhere tonight anyhow. <laughs> but you know what I love about this chapter, this book? If you'll keep reading, Ezra never shows up to chapter 7. Ezra, he just wrote what happened, but he didn't show up to chapter 7. By the time he gets there, it's already been going on a long time. And he gets there and gets them going on the temple, and they build it, and, oh well, just go ahead. I've got to show this one verse if they don't see anything else tonight. I'm sure oh, yeah. nothing about this one. It's in 8. The, the one where he, this is absolutely amazing to me. In Ezra chapter 8, verse 21 to 23, Okay, Ezra's ready to leave. The king has said, go. The king has said, build it. He gave him the money. And now they got one more problem. They're afraid because they got all this gold they're taking with them. They're targets. There's no security. You can't call 911. There is no 911. You got that, all right? And so he wants to ask the king for one more favor, send soldiers to guard us. But look at what he says. Then I proclaimed a fast there at the river of Ahava that we might humble ourselves before our God to seek him for a safe journey for us, our little ones, and all our possessions. For I was ashamed, read this with me, for I was ashamed to request from the king troops and horsemen to protect us from the enemy on the way because we had said to the king, the hand of our God is favorably disposed to all those who seek him. But his power and his anger against all those who forsake him. So we fasted and sought our God concerning this matter, and he listened to our entreaty. And if you read verse 31, they got there safely in four months. Well, here's my point. This is a man that loves that king. Ezra cared about the body. Why do you say that? Because he cared about his witness. Right. Yeah. He cared about his witness. This king had done so much for these people who he brought as slaves. He hauls out, if you were here last week, we read where he hauled out all the gold um, bulls from the temple. Millions upon millions of dollars worth of gold and said, here, you, have, you need to take this back, it's holy. Mm -hmm. He had done everything for them, and Ezra knows if I go and ask them for soldiers to keep us safe, they'll do it, but I already told them our God is able. Yeah. Right. This is a man who loves people. A man, if God can do... A, was the protection in that difficult journey automatic? Uh-uh. Do you know what they did? They saw it. They fasted and prayed. I just want you to understand that what you have on your heart may not be automatic, but if you say, I'm going for it, and God is going to finish what he created me to do, everything is going to be there. Yeah. 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 All right. I, I just love that. I don't know if it blessed you, but can, I just love the fact that he didn't want to compromise his testimony. It would have been so easy. Yeah. Let's just start reading, and we'll read for a minute here, Ezra 1, 3, and 4. The king, Cyrus, says, whoever there is among you of all his people, may his God be with him. Let him go up to Jerusalem, which is in Judah, and rebuild the house of the Lord, the God of Israel. He is the God who is in Jerusalem. Every survivor, whatever place he may live, let the men of that place support him with silver and gold and goods and cattle together with a free will offering for the house of God, which is in Jerusalem. Do you know what that tells me? These people needed freedom to go. They needed the permission and blessing of the king to go. They got it, and they're broke. They can't afford So he said, let everybody everywhere, if, if somebody says, I'm called to go, well, he said, let everybody around him take the offering up. Isn't that amazing? Yeah. Praise God. The second year they were back, Okay, you know what? We're not going to get any farther than we got last week. Said, You're wasting our time, Pastor. I don't think so. No. I think that there's a heaviness in the heart of Christians. Once you get serious about serving God, it becomes one of the most passionate things in your life is to know I'm not wasting my life. Yeah. To know I'm making progress. To know that this day has been one step closer to the highest call of God in my life. And I know a whole lot of Christians that carry heaviness in their heart because life is so daily in the voices. It's just not happening. Yeah. How many ever heard that voice? It's just not happening. Well, I'm here to tell you tonight the devil's a liar. Yeah. I walked into this place Sunday night. We had had a baccalaureate. It was a nice baccalaureate. But it wasn't like on fire, okay? Who was there? It wasn't like fiery, right? I walked through the door. 
presence of God was in this place. Yeah. Fire of God. Y'all were singing about the blood. The fire of God was in this place. I thought, dear God, who would believe that this service is happening in a little town of 3,000 people on a Sunday night when nobody has Sunday night services? God is up to something here. And he is up to something here. But until you let him put within you the vision for the next five years, don't just go for 30 years. What is, we see 30 years down the road. And we think, well, it's not happening, so we quit. Let him under, pick up on the fact that God has his hand upon us and upon you. You can read all the way. Okay. Oh, I can't believe it. Six minutes till. Go to Esther 3. This is... 42,000. In Ezra 2, you find out 42,000. And you say, was everybody supposed to go? No. Daniel was supposed to stay and help King Cyrus and King Darius. Esther was supposed to stay and be the wife of Oh, You know what I'm saying? Some people weren't called to go. But some of them were. Now, in Ezra 3, after a few years, they finally got the, the, the foundation laid. And look at verse 10. Now when the builders had laid the foundation of the temple of the Lord, the priests stood in their apparel with trumpets, and the Levites and the sons of Asaph with cymbals to praise the Lord according to the directions of King David of Israel. Who taught them to worship like that in royal apparel with trumpets? They did. Did they have to have the temple finished to worship like David? No. I don't know. All they got is a slab. How many of you remember when this place was a slab? It's a slab. It was not exciting. It was just a slap. <laughs> Verse 11. They sang, praising and giving thanks to the Lord, saying, For he is good, for his loving kindness is upon his room forever. And all the people shouted with a great shout when they praised the Lord because the foundation of the house of the Lord was laid. That's cool. Yeah. Yet, many of the priests and the Levites and the heads of the father's household, the old men who had seen the first temple, wept with a loud voice when the foundation of the house was laid before their eyes, while many others shouted for joy, so that the people could not distinguish the sound of the shout of joy from the sound of the weeping of the people, for the people shouted with a loud shout, and the sound was heard far away. Now I want to tell you that's not going to be in like ministries. Come on. Because I really believe in verse 12, when it says the priests and the older ones, there were folks who were supposed to be singing and rejoicing. They had come back supernaturally. A king that could care nothing about them said, Go home! Yeah. Here's the money. Here's all the stuff from the temple. Yeah. Go with my blessing. If we had had time to keep reading, he issues orders. You're not allowed to tax them. Oh, by the way, all your tax money is going to go to them to fund the building of the temple. It's a pagan king. This is crazy. This is too good to be true. This is the stuff of fairy tales. And he carried out all his plans for them. Yeah. Verse 13, it says, they couldn't distinguish the sound of joy from the sound of weeping. I'm here to tell you tonight, this is not going to be the picture of new life. The old men were weeping because they thought the plan of God for their lives should have been further along by now. If only, if only Nebuchadnezzar had not been allowed to burn the temple. Okay. Then we could, hey, you know what? What's in the past is in the past. How many of you ever made a mistake? It's back there somewhere. I know so many people. Well, I just can't be happy because I have this vision. Well, that should not be a reason to be sad. Right. And you say, it's not happening. It never will happen if you keep saying it forever. It's not happening. You are repeating the voice of Satan. Yeah. Right. But I want to tell you, listen, I'm talking to everybody. People think, oh, you're picking on me. Oh, no, I, I can give you two dozen people this advice. I'm serious. If God calls you, he's faithful. Amen. If God calls you and he has to speak to a president or a king, he'll do that. If God called you, he'll... You see, the reason I... You say, well, you're not making any sense. I'm only trying to make sense. One of the reasons I wanted to get away is because I know a trip can be life-changing. Yeah. Totally life-changing. Yeah. Easy to see. I mean, my parents took me to Europe twice when I was almost seven years old. Totally changed my view of the world. My interest in school was off the charts because geography was real to me, cultures was real to me, languages were real to me, and whatever. Right. The second time, 
that I went to Europe. I was 19 and I was engaged to the wrong man. And you say, oh, how dare you admit it? Well, Gordon was engaged to the wrong girl and he broke it off too. But anyhow, I didn't know I was engaged to the wrong man and my, my parents didn't know. I guarantee you if I had followed through with the wrong engagement, I wouldn't be here to, it would have been the end of the, you know, that just wouldn't have happened. I got back and thank God, I realized, I saw him there, yeah, that's a problem. It changed my life. Yeah. Well, this time, I knew one thing. If I didn't get better vision than what I had, uh -huh. I'm just spinning my wheels spiritually. Mm -hmm. I just realized, mm. um, you you in one place, day, and you love what you do, but it's so daily. Yeah. And that that's one reason I said, you know what, we're going to get away. But when, when I came back, I only had one prayer for that trip. Is God give me perspective and give me renewed vision. Hallelujah. And you see, you may think I'm too old to still have a vision. Come on. I, there's a whole other... Yeah, there is. Right? Ahead of me. Yeah. And ahead of you. And ahead of this church. Amen. Hallelujah. But as long as we say, well, I would love to believe it, but it's just not happening. We'll sit there and you're the up. Come on. Bridget. Sit there in the unbelief. Yeah. I believe it's happening. Yeah. I walked in here the other night. The fire of God was on the place. I thought, dear God, if those people knew, they'd be here. This is good. Yeah. But you know what I know? Oh, I don't got to quit. Don't have it. Glory to God. <laughs> <laughs> That's as close as I ever come to square. I, I can remember in the old building, we had such crummy facilities. Did we not? <laughs> We were running from someone who would not fix the roof, and we would sometimes have special speakers with it, with it leaking, that leaked on Reverend Dallas's head more than once. Yeah. How humiliating. <laughs> and yet here's what's so strange. The presence of God sometimes came so strong. Yeah. But we would just sit there for half an hour, and nobody would say anything. God. And I used to tell God, this church is the best kept secret in three counties. How long can something this wonderful be kept a secret? And you know, we're not as much a secret as we used to be. But there'll come a day when it'll be less of a secret than now. Yeah. And I don't know if I can help you in this, but how many of you would just read the book of Ezra? I, I, I've never been an expert on Ezra, I'll be honest. First time I've ever, ever tried to preach. Nehemiah is easy to teach from. Ezra's not that easy because there's a lot of details involved. But just start making yourself a list of how many miracles they needed to even think about doing the will of God yeah. and how God, if God said it, then it's his responsibility yeah. to make it possible. Yeah. And if you say that there's no open doors, well, it's God's responsibility. It's your responsibility to get ready, get ready, get ready, get ready for those open doors. Get ready as if the doors were already open. Hallelujah. Do everything you can do to help the move of God forward where you are today. And don't listen to that voice and say, well, it's just not happening. That's a lie from the pit of hell. And for goodness sakes, everybody listen to these very carefully. Don't ever repeat <coughs> the enemy. Yeah. Repeat, yeah. whatever you repeat gives power to it. You're a, you're a powerful person. Yeah. Don't ever repeat, I don't think God's will is coming to pass in my life. Yeah. I just want you to know the one thing I got out of that trip is I love where I live. I love my home. I love my church. I love y'all. And I love that there is a future for this place. Oh, yeah. That I refuse to live in a place where the sound of the shouting and the sound of the weeping can't be distinguished because people are so confused. Yeah. That was confusion that day. Yeah. We are not going to mourn because we're over 50. Yeah. I feel like walking through every person that I suspect might be over 50 and telling you that. We are... You know what? God had you born on the right day, at the right time of the day that day. He knows what he's doing. Yeah. I, I remember my dad teased me when I turned 40. And he said, oh, you're going to be 40. I said, I'm 40 years closer to seeing Jesus than I ever had been. It's all I've lived for since I was a child. I want to see Jesus. If you told me I'm going to go home by tomorrow morning, I would say, let's party! <laughs> Not that I don't like y'all, but I'll like you even more in heaven. I'll see you when I get, you get there. <laughs> But I don't want to go to a church where some of us are happy because we're young and we know all the young people. I love the young people. Yeah. Young go, oh, God's doing everything for your life. And then someone said, life's the day. Like, I don't see it happening. 
I just wish you would make a commitment between you and God right now that you will never, as long as you live, blaspheme the living God by saying, unfaithful is the one who called me and he's not bringing it to pass. Wow. I'm trying to break the shell of unbelief off of you. Right, right. Because if we ever come to a point where the young people are shouting, the sad nation's late, and the old men are shouting, the sad nation's late, and the young lady is saying, Whoo! Yeah. If you're over 50 in your life, thank God for life. Amen. Thank God for a chance to change history. Hallelujah. I'm done. Somebody better get up here because I'm not, I'm not going to put any thoughts on How many of you believe God has a plan for your life if you have a, at least an inkling of what it would be? If you don't, I'm going to like come around and lay hands on you. you <laughs> never won your line. Yeah. Or you need a plan. Yeah, yeah that's good. God really wants you to repent of bemoaning your age. He had you born that day. He's kept you alive until this day. That means he has a purpose for you on this planet. Because if he didn't, I guarantee you, heaven's better and he loves you enough to take you home. We're here for a purpose. And we're not going to be the congregation that shouts and weeps and mourns at the same time. How many of you would, would, would I'm just, you know, I'll think of what you do when you see you need to repent. Yeah. You see, when I say that unfaithful is he who calls you and he will not take it to pass, you want to slap me. Because yeah. that's blasphemy. I understand that's blasphemy. But all I'm doing is articulating what certain people have already been saying. And I want you to see it tonight as atrocious, as an insult to the living God. If you serve the same exact God as Ezra, then faithful is the one who put the call of God on my life. And faithful is he who compels it. Okay, if you need to repent, when everybody close your eyes, I'm not going to look. I promise I'm not going to look. If you need to repent, raise your hand. Say, Jesus, Jesus. I'm, sorry I'm sorry for complaining about how old I am. Thank you for life. You've kept me in life. And I thank you for my life. I thank you for the opportunity to help write history. And now for the rest of you are young, but you need to say, Lord, I'm sorry for saying it's not happening. Those were the words of Satan. And I, I promise you, I will never say it again. That's very weak. Is there anybody here who would promise God that you will never, ever, ever be in the weeper saying it's not happening? If you will, raise your hand. Oh, Father, we all are sorry for the times we've hurt you with our unbelief. You have been so remarkably faithful, inutterably faithful. Lord, I pray right now for fresh vision for every life. I pray that you would not allow that vision to be tainted by a number and age. Father, I pray that you would just explode within us your joy, Holy Spirit, that you're well able not only to call but to do it. We commit. We commit to be a congregation that rejoices in the goodness of God and never weeps over the lives of Satan. In Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Hallelujah.